So, Mike Ross, welcome to the Ferndale Library podcast. Thank you so much, Jeff. It's good to see you. Thanks for uh, everyone at home tuning in. Uh, the name of the show, of course, as you know, is a little too quiet. It's brought to you by the friends of the Ferndale Library. And my name is Jeff Milo, and Mike is here because literally, what, two days ago, we hung a lot of artwork in the library. Day before yesterday. And it was thrilling for me because I've been a fan of your work for a long, long time. One could say almost exactly 10 years I've been a fan <laughs> of your work. That would be a tidy way to, to put it. Actually, there is, it's, a, it's an audio medium, but there is a piece of paper right in front of you. You might recall this paper, Mike. Yes, I sure do. So I, I have a couple of them. You have an art exhibition inside the library here uh, in January of 2023. That's present day, everyone. If you're listening to us far in the future, hopefully everything's still okay and the earth is still stable. But here we are, January 2023, we're looking 10 years to the past, and it was this was like your first big show. It was. It, Jan- was, my first, it was my first solo exhibition. Incredible. January of 2012, 2013. Right, and, 2013. Yes, and the library had pretty much just formed its own art and exhibitions committee that was going to be dedicated to simply that, putting art into the library, supporting local artists, and giving patrons who are coming in and out of the library a chance to encounter the local art scene and uh perhaps their their day is that much more enriched by uh <laughs> the exposure to the beautiful work that is on display especially when it comes to to mike's work mike you've just done some dazzling dazzling stuff over the over the years and uh i feel like i should congratulate you on this 10-year marker <laughs> <laughs> thanks <laughs> thank you so what is, this this paper has some instructions on it Do, can you let's start maybe there and and just talk about your memories of that that show and and this idea. Yeah, so I've been thinking about it's kind of hard to put yourself in back in your uh, headspace of of 10 years prior. I had initially conceived of this. Well, first let me let me lay out what the actual concept is. Yes. And then we can then we can kind of talk about it's, it. It's got a time capsule quality to it. It's very much a time capsule in in a sense. It's a sort of time capsule that has that is designed to go out into the world and come back again <laughs> rather than just being buried and dug up. So yeah, the idea was basically I painted a painting. What was it? Like 2 feet by 3 feet, something like that. I painted a painting. I showed nobody not my wife, nobody. I didn't even take a picture. And I cut it into 60 pieces, 60 roughly five by five inch pieces. And I put little codes on them, letters and numbers, simple stuff, A1, A2, so on. And I said, I, I, with each one, I, a person who purchased one, I had them for $5 a piece, would get their little square of canvas along with this instruction sheet that we're talking about. And the instruction sheet essentially says, come back to the library on January 12th, 2023 at 4 p.m., which is when this uh, opening is. <laughs> and so you wrote this and printed it off without securing the plans to actually do the show. Well, I remember I talked to some, it was probably Lyndon. I yeah. think I talked to somebody else too and said, hey, is it possible to to book the library <laughs> for 10 years? Hence, uh, they said, well, well, you know, I don't know. I don't remember what their answer and, was. And but. as it gets lost through the cracks of time, I took over coordinating the art shows here around the middle of 2017. Okay. And I was very aware that you had this show, but I was absolutely not aware of this of experiment this project. Okay, until you and I caught up about a year ago. Right. So I thought it was thrilling, and I was like, "Yes, let's book you right now." <laughs> it's, yeah. So the idea is everyone brings their piece back if they remember or if they uh, you know get the news in time, mm-hmm. and then we put the painting together so people can finally see exactly what it looks like must have been a quietly profound moment when you finished this because you probably had it in mind knowing oh i am going to cut this up the experience of finishing that painting must have been singular compared to the finishing of any other painting yeah it's an interesting thing ordinarily you finish a painting and you say okay this this painting is finished whereas this one is kind of like this painting is sort of just getting going right Not, since since the painting is finished it is uh that's where, where its life sort of begins but it's a very so, accelerated preciousness because when a painting's finished it, it whether or not it sells that day or a year from now or five years you know it's permanent you know you can look at it whenever you feel like it if it's hanging in your studio per se sure you only had five minutes to actually look at that thing <laughs> before it got chopped up before it got chopped up true it's gone true, no photos true. or anything nope 
so, yeah, well, true, true, very true. It, it's interesting my my how my my perception of this piece has changed over the course of the ten years. I initially did it. I I'm a big Yoko Ono fan. I I read her book Grapefruit, which is filled with all these sort of conceptual ideas and things. Nothing quite like this. So I had it in my mind as this like sort of high concept piece mm -hmm. and the idea of essentially not forcing, but just sort of suggesting to people to, you know, people who are in a given place at a given time to come back to that place in a, in a different time. And it's almost sort of like a, a checking in sort of a thing mm -hmm. like, hey, I'd like to get all my friends back together again in 10 years. You know, it's, al it's almost got like a reunion quality to it. Not that, you know, over the I, I didn't sell them all on that day, you know, at that opening, whatever. It's been a gradual process over the years. Some of them, I, I have two pieces left, actually, okay. which I'll bring. Some of them have just only sold in the last few months, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, whenever I think of it, I bring the box back out and I say, oh, yeah, I've still got some of these pieces. I did forget about it for a good probably five or six years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'll bring it out occasionally and, you know, set it out and people are like, oh, it's a cool idea, whatever. But as I was saying, how it has changed over the years, it's become a lot a little bit more of a poignant thing mm -hmm. to me. I've, it's kind of funny. I've got a line here at the end on this instruction sheet that we're looking at. Where it gets so, a little dark and existential. It gets a, <laughs> exactly. Continue to meet this way every 10 years. I'm, I'm sort of amending that piece. I'll get to that in a bit. Continue to meet every 10 years until everyone is dead or otherwise unable to show up any longer. And blah, blah, blah. Mourn the death of each other, of the painting, <laughs> of the event. <laughs> And then it says, or, uh, number 8A, hand your piece down to a younger person once you're older dying, along with these instructions. I don't know how many people have done that. I will say, like I said, it's become a little more poignant to me over the years. I do know I at least two people who had pieces who are now no longer with us. Mm -hmm. I doubt they handed their pieces down to a younger person. And I was going to say, um, like, 10 years is longer than we're giving it credit. Like, a lot in our lives can really change. A lot changes in yeah. 10 years, you yeah. know? I mean, my mindset about things in general is a lot mm -hmm. different than it was, you know? You're still the same person, but you learn things. You're exposed to things that kind of change the way you think about the world mm -hmm. and the way you see things, you know? Um, so, yeah, it's uh, it's become a little bit more emotional. One of those people who had a, a piece of the, of the two people, one was a good friend and the other one was my mom. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like I, I look at this now and, uh, you know, that I, I can't help but think about that sort of thing, mm -hmm. you know, too. Mm -hmm. So, but it'll be interesting to see how many pieces do show up. I will say not to give away too much that the painting itself, it's a very simple painting. There's mm -hmm. not much to it. I think a lot of people who saw the pieces that they were <laughs> receiving were like, this is just, you know, <laughs> one solid color. <laughs> But it sort of has a coded, there's, there's, there's a little bit of a code in there. So if enough pieces of the painting come together, people can, are going to be able to read what that code sure. sort of is. Sure. Yeah, it'll, like I say, it'll be interesting to see, see what comes back. You used this word perception earlier, and I really want to riff on that because I think it's very big with you. Can you, can you talk about what, what really draws you to that? Because I think this in and of itself is really indicative of that, like, if I'm holding this one piece, what does this piece mean by itself? What does it mean together? Who am I now? Who am I then? What am I thinking about when I look at this piece? That that's all really intrinsic into what you what you do. You know, I think that perception it's really it's a thing that's defined by each individual person, you right. know. Everyone has their own way of seeing everything, really. And I think we, we ascribe meaning to things in completely different ways from one person to another, even from one moment to another, mm -hmm. you know, it's always, it's always changing, you know, as, uh, as a piece of art should always be changing, you know, um, that's why people put art on their walls. Mm -hmm. uh, ideally, I think you can look at a green wall and it's a green wall, you know, but if you have a piece of art hanging on that wall, it might look, you know, it's going to look different to you first right. thing in the morning than it does before you go to bed at night, you know? Yep. And that's not just because of the changing light. It's different times. You have different moods of the day. And just like I say, from one moment to the next, you can see things in a completely different way. You can hear some news, which changes your world forever, you mm -hmm, know, or mm -hmm. you can have a nice cup of coffee and it, you know, it eases your outlook on things. Let's dive into one of my newly favorite, because I just laid eyes on it within the last two months. One of my favorite pieces is yours. And I know it's dear to you, too. It's titled Moby Dick. Mm. And so 
let's riff on this. I because that you recently shared, I think it was uh, ten of your mostly favorite pieces on Facebook, for example, mm-hmm. and that was included in it of twenty twenty two, right? <laughs> And but, uh, right, maybe in general too. Right, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and it's this incredible piece. And I guess before I get into that, this might be—that's my teaser. We'll get back to Moby Dick, folks. In about five <laughs> minutes, we're going to flashback. Uh, you know, do take us back to when you were studying art and getting into the art scene. Did you see yourself as uh, an abstract artist, uh, a modernist artist? Do you think in those kinds of terms, in terms of your mm, style, not your medium, but your style? Do you think of that kind of stuff? Because when people look at your pieces now, and even in some pieces in 2023, color is very big. Shapes, lines, patterns. Um, I just talk a bit about how you got there and what you drew you to there and then we'll get back to Moby Dick we'll get back to Moby Dick I I had some more things to say about uh the 10 year thing as well too which we can get back to of course to answer your question do I think in terms of uh you know what led me to the to the style that Mm -hmm. I paint in things like that I will say that I don't think about those things at, at all um, in terms of that academic, <laughs> that academic cordoning off of this is an era of style, this is an era of style, this is a discipline, this is a... You can only see those things in retrospect, though, right, right. you know, uh, for me. I I can, sure, I can look back and say, oh, in 2016, you know, I, I really got on this uh, this this jag of, of this way of doing things, whatever. I think a painter's job is a job Mm -hmm. you know and like anything you have to learn it and you have to learn it's like learning a language it's like learning anything you so a painter's mode of expression is to paint Mm -hmm. right just like your mode of expression is to write Mm -hmm. and you weren't born writing i wasn't born painting uh but you learn these things you learn i guess at some point you make a decision maybe as to what your mode of expression is going to be Mm -hmm. And, you know, once you decide on that, you sort of work to master that mode of expression. And you never do, which I think is great, because if you say you've mastered something, then why why continue? Then it's <laughs> yeah, easy. Then it's done. Right. Um, but I think you have to constantly be working to, you know, striving towards a perfection that doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's a painter's job, a writer's job, an artist's job. Um or not even necessarily. I, I don't really like the word artist, mm-hmm. on it, to, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I think that kind of, uh, it's sort of a hoity-toity word, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, whatever you do, in, in whatever your job is, whatever you've chosen as your uh, occupation to enrich your life, right, right. <laughs> you, uh, you strive to perfect it, yeah. you know, I think in, in an ideal situation. So I'm not sure how I got off on this tangent, but yeah, in those terms, okay, I remember. In those terms of like a style or uh, an era, whatever, a period of, mm-hmm. of a, a piece of art, um, you know, I, I think you only see those things in retrospect. Mm-hmm. I never consciously say, this year I'm going to do this kind of thing. You know, mm-hmm. I'm going to work with patterns, whatever. Over the years, I've done a lot of very different things. Um, I've had periods where I really only do figurative stuff mm-hmm. or, and I painted a lot of animals and you know true. as as you note I paint I work a lot with patterns mm-hmm. I still work a lot with patterns I kind of always have uh it's a thing that speaks to me that I um I never feel like I'm quite finished with it mm-hmm. so that's why I'm always coming back to it I wonder if you've heard this because it's just something personal to me but there's something about the patterns you make and the colors you choose that I find calming and there and this is so subjective i don't know if this is anything for you or if you hear it often but i don't know there i don't know if there's anything about kind of a a sense of an order out of chaos kind of thing or a chaos within order uh going on in your pieces but um there's something that i find weirdly calming when i look at it i'm glad to hear you say that i'm glad to hear you say that because i think part of what i've chosen as uh as my mode of work is you know, as a as a painter, I think you paint the things that you want to see, yeah. right? I think a, a lot of times, uh, you know, life can feel pretty chaotic, mm-hmm. and so a lot of times you put that chaos down on on the canvas because it's 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 what's out there, mm-hmm. it's what's in there, you know, and it comes out, and then you, I think the urge for me 
is to sort of try to make an order out of that, mm -hmm. you know? So, uh, yeah, your, your terms of order and chaos, I think that's right. And I, yeah, I do strive the, the color palette is something that I just find endless, uh, endlessly fascinating mm -hmm. to work with. Um, and it's constantly evolving, you know, it's funny speaking of retrospect, I can look back at there, there was a time, there was probably six or seven years mm -hmm. when I refused to ever use the color red in anything. Really? <laughs> yeah. I just completely stayed away from it. I couldn't tell you why. It's mm -hmm. not like I dislike it. I just didn't want it in my paintings for mm -hmm. some reason. Um, I'm past that now. I love red and I use it all the time. Um, now I'm kind of away from green. I love the color green, but I don't use it mostly. You know, there are greens that come out whatever we're kind of getting into technicalities but um i was gonna say that there's something warm yet alien about the color palette that you have landed into or the things that you like to work with and it almost reminds me of that 70s animated movie fantastic planet oh cool some of the blues that happen in that film some of the yellows mm -hmm. so whatever you're doing uh um on your palette is is incredible well i like for people to uh I like what you said. I, I like for people to feel becalmed yeah. by my work. You know, um, I'm not trying to add any anxiety to anybody's life. <laughs> We've all got enough. Right. Of that. And that's the uh, thing. And I think that that might be happening in this. Um, you know, pardon me for being so presumptive and subjective of like, this is what I think of your work, Mike. But when I look at, uh, for example, two murals you did here in Ferndale, one over here at the web. Mm hmm. I'm literally pointing at I could hit with a rock mm. right now. Mm -hmm. Not that I would. Don't throw rocks at paintings. <laughs> uh, or at the dot in the parking structure right here in downtown Ferndale. I think you can look at those pieces and a lot of pieces and see lots of different lines, different colored lines, different shapes, different energies. And there's no dissonance. They're not crashing into each other. It's almost as though river style, they are all in some sort of harmonious flow together. And I think that's why I find them calming. Because uh, there are a lot of things and shapes on your pieces, but they seem to be speaking the same language in some sort of weird way. Okay, well, that's my I, thought. I, I, I love it. I, that makes me feel like I'm doing my job. Yeah, <laughs> harmony. Um, but yeah, the reason I, I fumbled with such a word as like abstract is we can look at a piece uh, like Moby Dick, almost five minutes to the dot, folks, <laughs> uh, where... There are uh, kind of these s barely separated shapes that possibly form what looks like a sperm whale. Mm -hmm. That uh, and some brilliant like uh, pale blues, like this, just th literally the suggestion of blue. I don't even know if there's blue there. It's it's mm -hmm. so ghostly uh, and beautiful. Um, so that picture was posted to Facebook, and I shared it uh, with our mutual friend and author josh malaroon because he's a big fan of moby dick and i said mm. i just shared it i just posted it in a, in a message with him look at this latest work by mike Gross. and he said wow that's amazing and then i said it's titled moby dick and then he said oh my god i see it he didn't see it immediately mm -hmm. and now it's like he can't unsee it right and i find that interesting that thing of like you're looking at it and you can do what you want with it. But the title is will suggest. Mm -hmm. I don't have a question there, but that's like an interesting dynamic that's going on in your work. How? Almost always the titles. Well, sometimes I'll come up with a phrase that I like mm -hmm. or a word or just whatever and just jot it down and say, let's make a good title for sure. a painting, you know, <laughs> and then I eventually I might paint something that owns that title. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the time the titles come later. And um, as I was telling you the other day, I've been reading Moby Dick to my uh, now 19-month-old son. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been reading it to him since he was three days old. Mm -hmm. So I've really completely fallen in love with the book. And um, when I painted that painting after it was complete, something about it spoke to me and said, the title of this painting is Moby Dick. Um, I don't know that I would ever intentionally paint a painting of a sperm whale and call it Moby Dick. You know what I mean? That's too, that's, that's almost too, right. You know, I don't want to be so direct. Right. But I can't unsee it. Sure. It's there now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that doesn't happen with all of your pieces and, or necessarily many of your pieces, but I think there's something really magical about that one. And so, yeah, that was my, that was my pedestrian uneducated 
question of, did you try to paint a whale, Mike? Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's fascinating. But yeah, so, um, and I mentioned murals, which was a teaser. So can you tell me about the experience of painting a mural uh, versus painting just a painting? The obvious is, um, it's probably a pretty obvious answer, but what is that process like for you? Well, it's a complex answer because I haven't quite worked it out myself. Mm -hmm. I love painting murals. Um, I love painting large. Um, before I started painting murals, I was painting larger and larger. And I had it in my mind, I want to paint some murals, you know, and as it happened, uh, bless his soul, our friend Dustin Leslie got a hold of me out of the blue, as I'd been thinking, oh, you know, I want to paint some murals. And he said, Hey, we need a mural at the Wab. Do you want to come paint a mural? And I said, absolutely. Um, so the and that, that ended up with a series of four murals, two outside, two inside. Incredible. That yeah. uh, that exterior has to be at least 20 feet long. Yeah, I Roughly. think it's something like 20 by 20 by 12 yeah. or 10, something like that. Yeah, so there's two, I guess I approach murals in two different ways. Mm -hmm. My favorite way and the way that uh, happens increasingly less <laughs> as, as the projects get larger um, and what Dustin said and what a few people have said since is we like what you do, do what you do, you know, which I love. Um, and because so much of my work really involves a lot of uh, improvisation, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's improvisation within a structure, I guess you'd say. What I have a harder time doing, but enjoy just as much, I guess you could say, or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe I enjoy it less, but I when it's a larger project, mm -hmm. a bigger company or whatever that hires me to paint a mural and says, you know, we want a mural. This is the size of the wall and we need, you know, three sketches as options, you know, um, happily still, they generally say, we like what you do, just do what you do. But for me, it's always a little bit more rewarding when I can just, uh, get up on the scaffolding or whatever and, and let things happen. Um, I, I like working from sketches less, mm -hmm. but I'll still do it and I'm still happy to do it. And I still get a lot of enjoyment out of creating the sketches and I still get a lot of enjoyment out of um, painting the actual mural. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's the most fun. So um, is it unconscious in that way then? The way you spoke of Moby Dick, like, again, me on the other side of the table, I'm like, did he did he think he was going to paint a whale from the get go? Uh, was it all instinct? Was it all unconscious? It was all unconscious. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And same with that. The the some of the murals, at least. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, and then there's isn't there another one in Ann Arbor that's like humongous? Yeah, that's, that's like your biggest yet. Yeah, it is my biggest yet, I believe. Um, the one at the dot, square footage wise, might be about as large, but. Yeah, this one's uh, what, five your, stories high. It's your highest. It's my highest for sure. <laughs> uh, five stories high. Yeah, that one was a blast. That was one that was real easy. They did want sketches ahead of time. I made one sketch. They said, we love it. Nice. You know, um, so that worked out. And I changed it considerably from the sketch. I um, Again, it was a big job. So, of course, I these, these changes were vetted. I mm -hmm. said, hey, I'm thinking maybe I'll do this instead of that, whatever. And in every instance they said sure do mm -hmm. what do what you do you know which i love and appreciate i uh i i thrive on that sort of confidence in my work mm -hmm. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. let me ask you a four point remember. question sure i'll try to i'll try to organize it but i'll throw i'll throw all four bullet points at you at once but i am curious to hear you know if if because I feel like they're all tied together. I think it's all one answer. I, I have said my own interpretations of your work. I have said how I feel calming when I look at them. And I've, you know, I really think perception and how the audience looks at your pieces is really interesting. Uh, is that, so I'm, I'm curious, you know, what do you find rewarding about the work that you do? Do you also, in fact, find it calming? And do you allow your th thought of an eventual audience to ever enter your mind during the creative process i think that's a little bit unavoidable at yeah. least at points mm -hmm. i 
try not to ever think of, you know, what people are going to think of something as I'm painting it. I'm mostly painting what, like I said before, like, like what I want to see, mm-hmm. you know, and I have to assume that uh, what I want to see is going to be similar to what some other people want to see, you know. <laughs> um, but the, oh, the way in which an audience interacts with your work is nevertheless fascinating to you. I do pick up on that. Sure, sure. Yeah, I sure. definitely think that, uh, you know, in some ways, in some ways, this is just a thought that just kind of occurred to me, so bear with me. I think a painting maybe is never finished until people see it, you know? Um, and that's an ongoing process, you know? Uh, the people who are looking at something right now are different than the people who are looking at something in 20 years, mm-hmm. you know? And again, that idea of the same person looking at something at a different time period. Um, I think I think the viewer completes a painting, you know. I mean, a, it, that's unavoidable. A, a painting is a visual thing, so it's like uh, you know, it's like reading a book. You don't the book doesn't really exist until someone's read it, mm-hmm. <laughs> in a sense. As the person writing the book or painting the painting, you're you're putting a thing into the world, but it's almost by definition an incomplete thing Mm -hmm. if that makes any sense at all um because part of it is just a thing that lives inside of you you know and you're sort of taking that mode of expression to make a representation of that thing that lives inside of Mm -hmm. you and so when somebody else comes along and and looks at it you know they're coming at it from a completely different person again the word perspective um and they've got a whole lifetime of experiences and things that they've seen and done and heard and said behind what they're looking at. Right. So they're going to have a different interpretation of what it means to them. It's the same with an author. The mm-hmm. uh, the All the books that Josh Mallon writes or Stephen King writes were once just quiet ideas in the back of their head mm-hmm. that no one but that writer knows about. Mm-hmm. And then it goes out and is absorbed and people make of it what they will. Yeah. And I make of this harmony out of chaos that and this calming sense. Um, so does that at all also resonate with you in terms of what you find most fulfilling? Because 90% of your experience is solitary in a sense. And only, you know, only 10% gets to be the fun part where you're out in the public talking to people and giving people shreds of canvas and sure. all that other stuff. So, yeah. If that. Uh, yeah. So very much is that, is that an intense or strange or comforting, positive, negative, complex experience when it's just you and the canvas Mike, as it often is <laughs> <laughs> or just, or just you in the wood. <laughs> well, I don't know if I'm, do you, the do right you even, person to, to do answer that Do you even get question. into that stuff? I guess not, yeah. I mean, you have your experience in the studio, and that's just you living, you know? Um, you're just not You're not necessarily one to wax poetic about that, love it, <laughs> magical stuff. Well. And it's okay if I you're mean, not. I mean, I, <laughs> it's <laughs> not to say that I'm not one to do that, right. but I just don't know that I'm... Uh, I don't know that I'm authorized to do that in a, in a sense, right, you know right. what I mean? Um, yeah, I love, there's not, there, there are a few things I should say in the world that I love more than just being in the studio mm-hmm. and working. Um, you know, you're on a podcast. It's the one place where you can be unjustifiably authoritative <laughs> about your opinions. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're modest enough not to be. It's great. It's, I don't know that it's modesty. I Mike, think it's Mike's just... like, Mike's like, the thing about art is, <laughs> this is the one chance you get to say that kind of stuff. Ah, I but know. you're, but you're resisting it. It's great. <laughs> I'm squandering my opportunity. It's okay. It's um, okay. But that's, that's, that's part of who you are as an artist though. That's fine though. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, I mean, I can talk a lot about art. Sure. No, no question about it. Um, as far as other people's experience of my own work mm-hmm. or whatever, uh, I'm not the person to say. Yeah. Uh, but I guess your question, uh, being, you know, uh, what's it like alone in the studio? Yeah. Something, something to what, that effect. Yeah. What um, are, yeah. What, and what are, what's the, fu- what is the fulfilling factor? Is it the color? Is it the shape, etc. You know, is it the harmony? Is it the chaos? Uh, it's just the, uh, it's all those things. It's yeah. the, it's the holistic experience, I yeah. guess, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, like I say, I love being in the studio. I, you know, 
It's a very different. It, it's interesting because it's a very different experience than say playing in a band mm -hmm. where you're you're with a group of people and you're creating something together and that can be intensely rewarding. I think there's something about that communion. Mm -hmm. Let's use that word. Let's bring that word into this conversation. Yeah, communal the, vibes. The, the communion that you have when you're creating something with other people, there is a, when things are going really well in the painting studio, you kind of get a shred of that mm -hmm. because it's kind of like there are, you know, I recently, I'm, I'm not one to, uh, I certainly don't go around talking about memes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I certainly don't post them or anything like that generally. But uh, I recently saw one, it was just a John Cage quote. And he's talking about, you know, when you start off a, a piece of work in the studio, you know, that your studio is, it's just you, but the studio is crowded with people. There are all these people in your head, you know, there are the critics, there are, you know, the people you talk to that day, there's, there's things going on. And one by one, as you're working, they all leave the studio. And eventually, if things are going really good, you leave too, you know, <laughs> <laughs> which I, I really like. I, yeah. It, it kind of resonated in the sense that like, that's true. When things are going really good, it's like you're not there. I interpret that as the rest of the distracting noise quiets, you know, incrementally mm -hmm. until it is a, that, a calm and quiet of your head is cleared per yeah. se. And then hopefully for those last few hours, your head is so clear that you will let yourself be done for the day. And then you can walk away. You can walk away. But I think I interpreted that quote almost as more you are gone in the sense that you're not consciously. It's not you. Yeah. You're not consciously acting. It's not you holding the brush, making conscious decisions. Incredible. You've, you've, you've left the scene and the painting is just kind of happening. Hell yeah. Hell you yeah. Know? That's so great. yeah, I like it. Yeah, and, and this it year, happens. And it since happens you're on a sometimes. podcast, and I'm riffing on your biography, you did mention playing in a band of music. That's a whole other side of you. You aren't just an artist in a in a studio. We met through the music scene. I sure. met you when you were in a band playing guitar, yeah. uh, and so that's a whole other side of you. Hey, I guess I did want to dip into that a bit because um, sure. you mentioned that you mentioned that you used to make skateboards. I did. And that must have been back in your in your band days when you were in the band Red China. It wasn't. Okay. Uh, I started doing the boards in 2011 or 12. Okay. Uh, around the time of this first show. Um, so is, yeah, it was just post heavy band period times. Sure. Heavy know. band period times is like 04-ish to 08-ish. Yeah. Yeah. Roughly. 08, maybe 10. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I always saw, uh, not to go off on a tangent, I always saw your band Red China as um, embracing a bit of a no wave energy. Ab uh, sure, absolutely. No wave, late 70s, early 80s, New York. Uh, some people would call it challenging music. Definitely <laughs> challenging. <laughs> um, yeah, we never consciously uh, did that, but that's just what came out, mm -hmm. you know, in a way. Kind of uh, art noise, art noise, I guess you could say mm -hmm. if you if you want to put a label on it uh no wave sure but you were already studying art at that time yeah yeah and mm -hmm. i was practicing art uh not so much out in the world but i was doing a lot of uh kind of assemblage stuff at that time stringing things onto boards and making weird piles of things that kind of stuff i always wondered if the if the skateboards were kind of an uh sort of an offsetting moment, kind of an activating moment for you in terms of building then later into your heavy visual art days? Maybe. It was kind of concurrent, though. Okay. Um, I had already started painting again a couple of years before because I took a, a number of years off of painting. I, uh, I studied painting in school, um, but that was in the mid-90s, mid-late 90s, and I really didn't start painting again until about 2010. So uh, probably just before I started painting the skate, doing the building the skateboards. Um, yeah, the skateboards were an offshoot of the fact that I uh, I liked skateboarding, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I I've always you know I've always kind of had the I always like to if I'm into something I want to do it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, I was into skateboarding, so I was like, you know what? I'm gonna I don't know anything about it, but I'm gonna try building skateboards. So I did that for I don't know six or seven years. 
Bulk of the 2000s, it's heavy band life. That brings us up to 2010. You start painting again, and then the skateboards, and that sort of brings us up to 2012 and to 2013, and we're back at the library show, the first show. <laughs> and you said you had things left unsaid about it that I wanted to kind of circle back to, and I do want to get to them soon, but do you have any other memories surrounding that show or perhaps even memories of, of maybe getting ready for it? you remember your your 10 10 years ago self getting amped for that show like oh this is exciting well one thing that has struck me recently um looking at pictures from from that show and that time period like maybe primitive <laughs> a lot of my work was then i was kind of just getting into the thing that i'm uh, i'm doing now you know mm -hmm. um so, but even in other ways, like my canvases were all wonky. I was building my own canvases. I still build my own canvases, but these days they're straight, you know, <laughs> <laughs> they were all wonky. Um, you know, now I build frames for everything. Yeah. Whatever. Um, yeah, no, that was, uh, it's kind of interesting looking back at, at that stuff. Um, I also do remember at the opening, speaking of music, we did play some, pretty abrasive music at the opening mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in a library no less in a library made a lot of loud noise i'm surprised <laughs> uh you know there were still people left yeah at the end um yeah yeah it, but it was fun i remember it being a lot of fun and uh pretty gratifying i had only done a couple of uh smaller like group shows mm -hmm. to that point i was just kind of kind of getting getting going you know mm -hmm. when you start when you start painting you know you, you start in a See, maybe, you have, I mean, I was literally in my bedroom. I had a tiny, it was about this size. We're sitting in like, what, an 8 by 10 room? 8 by 10, yeah. So, yeah. So I had a bedroom in my apartment in Royal Oak, and that's what I was painting in Wow. back then. And I was already painting fairly large canvases. So like practically an entire wall with some of these paintings and uh, and then a, a little futon that I slept in. Incredible. So uh, yeah, things have evolved a lot since then in mm -hmm. a lot of different ways. <laughs> Well, it felt like an awesome way to kick off what has become now 10 full years of this library consistently curating shows, even and possibly a few during the pandemic. And that that was a very special night. And I still have memories of it, too. And, and I think that because you had been threading into other art worlds around the area, specifically music, a lot of the music scene comes out to support you and you can see old I say old people from bands and photos from that night. Hey, and I, we're, we're all getting old. Man. We're all getting old. And I think they'll all be coming. They'll all be coming back, which is really exciting. Um, sure. That's a did hope. you have something else you wanted to say about this? We, we left breadcrumbs on the table. Uh, I do. About, so about the 2013 show. So the, about the, well, about the 10 year project. Right. So one of the things I, I, I had mentioned that I had amended this idea. Um, let's see. Number. What was it? Uh, oh, yes. Number six, meet same time, same place in 10 more years and repeat the process of putting this painting together. Uh, well, looking at it again recently, I was like, well, why would people do that? You know, so. Well, there's something ceremonial about that. Sure, sure. But I want to give them something more than that, mm -hmm. especially if they if everyone's already, you know, if enough pieces show up and everyone's already seen what this painting looks right. like, you right. know, it's kind of like just just ceremonial mm -hmm. and and but i want to give them something more so what i've done is i've painted another painting and uh have cut it up yes so so basically everyone who brings a piece back is going to get a new piece of an unseen painting and in 10 years should people show up again uh they can put together a completely different painting incredible yeah incredible so. also the timing of it all that this feels like such a New Year's esque, all Lang Syne kind of vibe. Sure, it's the whole yeah. time marker check in. The fact that we're doing it only two weeks into a new year mm -hmm. on both occasions, and hopefully three or four more occasions. Hopefully, it's so, it's so daring. It's so, it's so cosmic. It's so existential. Like, ah, it's uh it's like that uh, King song. This time tomorrow, mm, where where will we be? Where will we be 10 years from now? Hard to know. I love this Impossible show. to know, this really. show makes me think about that. That's great. We've gone into ASMR territory. We're not whispering. <laughs> uh, Mike, I'm so thrilled about this show. Uh, thanks for coming on the podcast and letting me pick your brain about <laughs> the process. Jeff, thank you so much. It has been an absolute pleasure. Um, and thank you so much for 
you know, you mentioned uh, a couple minutes ago that mm-hmm. you guys have been curating shows here ever since then. Yeah. And uh, I think that's just a fantastic thing that yeah. you guys do, yeah. that you specifically do. You know, I haven't sat down and um, meticulously counted, but we've basically averaged five shows per year. That's so fantastic. I feel like this may be the 50th. Whoa. I'll have to confirm that. But this might that might add more gravity to what we're doing here. I would be interested to know that count. Man. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you folks at home for listening to another episode of A Little Too Quiet. It's, of course, brought to you by the friends of the Ferndale Library. And the music you hear at the beginning of each episode and at the end is by local musician John Duffy. If you want to support this podcast, please go to ferndalefriends.org. But please also remember to rate, review, and subscribe. And uh, if you're hearing this in time, show up on January 12th of 2023 if you've discovered this podcast episode in the future show up to the library on january 12th of 2033 (laughs) uh thanks again mike hey thank you jeff we'll be back next week with more thanks for listening 